So I want to just uh, really quickly make a quick note. Okay, so I am so sorry for having to cancel the seminar last week. I was traveling and I was stuck in an airport and I got back here, but with not enough time to get from the airport to here. Um, so we're going to kind of just jump right into the to the seminar um, uh, this semester. And so um, we have Emily, who's going to do a presentation, and Chris Wilson, who is here to introduce her. Before we do that, um, just a really quick note. So attendance has been a uh, always been a little tricky, so we're going to try something new, and I think this will work better. So for in-person people here, I've got a sign-in sheet. You've got your name, the dates here, so just initial underneath the date that, that you're here. Um, for online people, I will just keep track of you, um, or a TA will keep track of you, so there's no need for you to do anything. Um, and I know I sent out two emails about the attendance requirements. If anybody has any questions or concerns about that, I have just a little bit more clarity on, on what is expected. Um, so if you do, like, especially, I think it's the in-person people who have the most concerns about it at this point. Um, so if you do have any concerns about your section and what's required in terms of attendance, just let me know. Um, and uh, and then I will always be around after class, you know, for questions or concerns and, and obviously email uh, and phone is great as well. All right. So Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you to do the introductions. Thank you so much for being here. All right, excellent. Well, thanks for uh, hosting uh, Dr. Emily Papo. Um, so I'm Chris Wilson. I'm a faculty member in the agronomy department, also an SNRE grad. Um, so yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Emily today. Um, so she was a recent graduate in the SNRE program, uh, co-advised by myself and Dr. Luke Flory. Uh, before that, she did her MS degree in the agronomy department with, with Luke's group. Um, and both the her master's and PhD were really focused around coffee, coffee agroecology, and I think really exemplify kind of the interdisciplinary ecology, you know, founding spirit in the SNRE curriculum. So she's looked at field production practices, done field manipulative experiments to kind of see how drought impacts coffee production. And she's also looked at uh, not just yield, but also coffee quality. So that's something she's going to talk about. That's a super important parameter for this type of cropping system. And she's thought broadly about the human systems context around all of this. And so one of her more recent publications was, you know, proposing a more synthetic um, framework for assessing resilience and cropping systems. So we were really excited about that one. Um, <clears throat> she's published four papers. Um, and has several more that are kind of in preparation in various stages. Emily has also won a whole long list of awards and honors. I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, she won the Graduate Student Teaching Award, so she was very active as a TA and doing supervised teaching, uh, including kind of uh, some pretty intensive uh, lecture development and contribution, and so I think was very deservingly recognized with that university level award. Uh, and she also took home a couple of awards for her presentations at the annual Tri-Societies conferences uh, in 2022 in Baltimore. Um, and she was exceptionally creative, I think, in her approach to kind of getting funding and support for her research. So working on coffee, it's kind of out of the mainstream of um, kind of agronomic crops that we normally deal with, um, involved a lot of international work. And so she was always very proactive about securing travel grants and funding awards wherever she could kind of get them to um, support all of that. And really it's it's hard to kind of say <laughs> uh, everything there is to say about Emily. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that. And uh, I think that it's gonna be a great overview of her research. Uh, and oh, I should mention two other things. One, of course, she's now a uh, po postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institute, so very happy about that. And two, just a technical note, wanted to kind of remind everybody that her camera is not working, so that's why her image will not be displayed, but uh, audio should be just fine. So I will leave it there and take it away, Emily. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be back, if virtually. Um, and so I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about the research that I conducted as a PhD student in SNRE. 
Um, and so today what I'm going to be talking about is a critical issue that faces people and ecosystems around the world. And the problem basically boils down to this. We need agriculture and a lot of it to be able to produce food, fiber, fuel, and other cash crops like coffee, which is gonna be the focus of my talk today. However, we know that climate change is making agriculture and agricultural production around the world more difficult and more risky. And any impacts that climate change has on agriculture could ultimately have a ripple effect, shaping the ability of working landscapes in which agroecosystems are embedded to support rural livelihoods and ecosystem services. And although I'm gonna be talking mostly about coffee systems in my talk today, uh, we do urgently need to consider climate impacts on all agroecosystems in order to more effectively forecast threats to global ecosystems and communities. But before I start talking about how I've worked towards addressing this problem, I wanna give you a little bit of context for how I became interested in these types of research questions. Prior to pursuing my academic career, um, I actually spent about 10 years working professionally in the coffee industry. I was a barista in New York. I worked on coffee farms in Hawaii, and I worked as a roaster and green coffee buyer for a company based in Maine. And during this time, I was lucky enough to travel and visit farms and taste a whole bunch of coffees all around the world. And it was on one of those trips that I had an experience that would shape the direction of my future research. I went to go visit a group of coffee producers who are amazing. They are known for being super careful, super skilled, having really high quality year after year. Um, but that year when I went to go visit their farms and taste their coffees, I was really surprised to find that they didn't taste the same. The coffees didn't taste the way that they typically did. And I asked them what they did differently that year. And they told me that actually they didn't do anything differently, but the weather had. And I became really curious, could changing weather, could climate change be responsible for changes to coffee quality? And if so, what would that mean for the resilience of global coffee agroecosystems? And so today I'm gonna to be talking about the three main areas of study that I focused on throughout my PhD research. First, I'm going to introduce the concept of agroecosystem resilience and discuss how I've approached understanding and measuring climate resilience in agroecosystems. Second, I will discuss my research evaluating how climate change might impact coffee quality. And third, I will discuss what climate-driven quality impacts could mean for smallholder producer livelihoods and agroecosystem resilience to climate change. And so let's start with this first question and talk a little bit about resilience what it means, why it's challenging to measure, and why ultimately I find it to be so important. Throughout my talk today, I'm going to be using this term resilience quite a bit. And so I wanna take a moment to explain what I mean when I use this term. There are two primary conceptualizations of the term resilience in natural systems. The first refers to how quickly a system recovers after some kind of disturbance. And so in this illustration, the steeper the walls of the cup, the faster the ball would return to its original position when pushed, which would be a more resilient system. It goes back to its baseline more quickly. And with the second conceptualization, we're less interested in understanding how quickly a system might recover to an original state, but we're more interested in understanding how much disturbance it can handle before it loses its ability to function and it changes to some other perhaps less desirable state. And so in this figure, how much effort does it take to push that ball into a different little cup? Now, in my research, I focus on agroecosystems. Agroecosystems necessarily rely on human input and management. They are what we refer to as social ecological systems because of this super tight interconnection between human and natural elements and feedbacks. And while resilience is not straightforward to understand and measure in natural ecosystems by any means, 
adding people into the mix makes it more complicated. In social ecological systems, people can intervene. They can stabilize a system. So you can think about an agroecosystem where human managers can irrigate in times of drought or they can apply pesticides to respond to pest outbreaks. Or people can transform a system entirely, actively adapting, pushing a system into some new steady state that might be more desirable for the human manager. And because of these active human interventions, it's actually really difficult to know when resilience is degraded in agroecosystems. And so to address this difficulty, I focus on elements of agroecosystem profitability as metrics of resilience in my research. And to help explain this, imagine there's two agroecosystems, system A and system B illustrated in this figure where profit is on the y-axis and there is a range of climate conditions on the x-axis. System A, shown here with the solid line, has the potential to be really profitable, but only under a really narrow set of conditions. As conditions become more variable, the profitability of this system drops steeply. And system B, on the other hand, shown here with the dashed line, it might not be able to be as profitable as system A under optimal conditions, but it can maintain higher profitability under a broader range of conditions. And if we think a little bit about what that means, it means that even if climate conditions change, system B will be more able to maintain resources to be able to respond to severe disturbances. And so if we think about the advancement of global climate change, it's likely that agroecosystems will experience a shift from experiencing more frequent optimal conditions to experiencing a broader range of conditions. So a system like system B that can maintain profitability across a broader range of conditions would be more resilient. And so it's really important to know how climatic shifts might influence elements of economic value and profitability in agroecosystems. And so that leads us into my next research question. Because understanding agroecosystem profitability is important for evaluating resilience, in coffee agroecosystems, that means knowing not only how climate change will impact yields, but also how it will impact coffee quality which is a critical element of economic value in coffee systems. But first, we'll take a step back so I can introduce the coffee system. In my work, I focus on coffee for a number of reasons. Coffee evolved as an understory shrub in the highland forests of Ethiopia. These shrubs produce little fruits that contain within them seeds that can be processed, dried, roasted, and brewed, into all the coffee drinks that we know, love, and probably rely on. Now, because that plant evolved in the understory, it can be grown effectively with shade trees, providing better habitat for biodiversity than many other agricultural systems. And this is especially valuable since coffee is often grown at or near biodiversity hotspots in the tropics and subtropics, making it incredibly ecologically impactful. It's also an incredibly socially impactful crop. Hundreds of millions of people around the world depend on coffee production for their livelihoods, including on an estimated 12 and a half million farms that are majority smallholder operations that can be found on four continents in over 60 countries. However, the ecological and social importance of the coffee production system is complicated by the sensitivity of the coffee plant. Coffee has a relatively narrow set of environmental requirements for its production, making it highly vulnerable to climate change. In fact, one recent modeling study found that the total global land area that is suitable for coffee production could decrease by up to 50% by 2050. However, often when we talk about climate impacts on agricultural systems, what we talk about is only yields or how much coffee these coffee trees will produce. But with coffee, it's not enough to only understand impacts on yields. 
Think back to my earlier story. It wasn't the loss of yield that I found surprising. It was the loss of quality. And so coffee quality can be assessed and understood both qualitatively and quantitatively. Qualitative assessment of coffee quality is descriptive. It's using standardized descriptive language for talking about coffee quality. It, the kinds of words you might use to describe what you wanna drink at a coffee shop, uh, I think maybe you want something that's chocolatey or nutty or fruity or full bodied. Those are qualitative assessment words for coffee. And these descriptions are really helpful for communicating about a coffee's properties. But I might really like coffees that are fruity and you might really like coffees that are chocolatey. And we can't really say that one is measurably a better using only qualitative assessment. Quantitative assessment of coffee quality, on the other hand, is numerical or measurable. The most common form of quantitative analysis is the use of the cupping form, like the one shown here, which trained evaluators can use to score coffee samples based on specific attributes like aroma, flavor, acidity, body, and balance to score that coffee on an 100 point scale where coffees that score at least an 80 can receive quality based pricing premiums. And that brings us to why coffee quality is so important to this discussion. Without going too deep into economics, coffee is a commodity. Its price is set by the futures market. And while price fluctuates quite frequently, often in recent years, it's hovered around only a dollar per pound. And the question then is whether that price is enough to provide a living wage or even cover costs of production for farmers. And if we look at data compiled from farms across six Central and South American countries, we see that the total cost of production averaged more than a dollar per pound across these countries. And so if farmers uh, are receiving commodity pricing, they could have a really difficult time covering costs of production and making a sustainable income. And there are multiple ways to work around commodity pricing or escape this commodity pricing. But Arguably, the path with some of the highest potential payouts would be through quality-based pricing premiums. And in this figure, we see how different types of coffees have been priced based on their quality. We're looking at lighter color bars here being lower quality coffees and darker bars being higher quality coffees. And across the board, coffee price goes up with increasing quality. And so, if climate change is going to impact both the quantity and the quality of coffee production, it could seriously compound challenges to economic sustainability. And alternatively, positive effects on quality could mitigate loss of income from declining yields. And so it's really important to understand how quality and quantity of coffee production could be impacted by climate change. And so what influences coffee quality? Well, the first thing to note is that the attributes that we experience as quality are related to plant biochemistry. Different secondary metabolites and volatile compounds combine to create the sensory and physical properties that we experience as flavor and quality. And that biochemistry is in turn influenced by many factors. For example, genetics. In the same way that a red delicious apple tastes very different from a Granny Smith apple, different coffee cultivars have really distinct flavor profiles. Additionally, harvest and post-harvest processing techniques play a really important role in determining quality, as do certain farm management practices like shading, pruning, and fertilizer use. And finally, and critically, the soil and climatic conditions on the farm play a really big role in shaping the taste and the quality of coffee. Coffee, like wine, has terroir. It picks up the unique flavors of its specific geographic origin. However, some questions about these impacts, especially in the face of climate change, still remain. First, 
Most research evaluating climate impacts on quality have focused on linking warming temperatures with quality declines. So questions still remain about the effects of changing water availability on coffee quality. Coffee is very sensitive to the timing and the quantity of rainfall um, and more frequent and severe droughts are very likely in many coffee growing regions. Second, quality is in essence an emergent property. It arises out of the interaction of these many factors. And so it's really important to consider how different factors like management practices and climate might interact to shape quality. And so now that we have a sense of coffee and the contributors to coffee quality, we can get into this second research question in a bit more detail. And so to answer this question, I conducted a field experiment in Costa Rica. This experiment was conducted on a lovely coffee farm called Finca Vino Tinto, right outside of the town of Santa Maria de Dota. The goal of the experiment was to test whether reduced water availability impacted coffee quality and whether that effect varied among cultivars. I planted coffee seedlings of four cultivars under either control shelters or rainout shelters that reduced soil moisture by an average of 14%. The cultivars in the study were collaboratively selected with local stakeholders to help uh, better understand how the more traditional cultivars planted in the area would hold up against newer hybrid cultivars that were uh, in the process of being introduced. And ultimately, over several years, I harvested and processed the fruits from these trees and evaluated the impact of reduced water availability on both yield and quality. The yield data was published in a manuscript in the journal AOB Plants, and today I am going to be discussing the impacts on quality. And so I took a two-part approach to quality analysis for this project. First, I conducted a sensory analysis of roasted coffee samples through a collaboration with coffee tasters from Bold Bean Coffee in Jacksonville. I roasted coffee samples on an Akawa Pro sample roaster, which is Bluetooth operated. It allows really good consistency among the different roasts. And then we used the industry standard cupping form that I introduced earlier to collect quantitative data on sensory attributes. Second, to supplement and perhaps explain any changes in sensory quality perceived by the evaluators, I was also interested in identifying what biochemical changes might be driving sensory quality shifts. And to this end, I collaborated with uh, Dr. Thomas Calhoun and Dr. Shea Keen of the Environmental Horticulture Department and Plant Innovation Center here at UF to analyze the volatile organic compounds that were present in the coffee samples. Volatile organic compounds are organic chemicals that produce vapors at ambient temperatures. And so, for example, if we were to all walk outside right now and the lawn outside the building had been freshly mown, we would all get a nice big whiff of that fresh cut grass smell, which is lovely. But what we're really experiencing and sensing in that moment are volatile compounds, things like Z3 hexanol that have been released into the air by those cut leaves of grass. Coffee seeds contain many of these compounds. And by looking at how their concentrations change in response to changing rainfall, we can get a sense of what might be responsible for changes in flavor. And so we collected the volatiles from finely ground unroasted coffee seeds and used gas chromatography mass spectrometry or GCMS to identify and quantify the volatile compounds in each sample. The results of the sensory analysis suggested that coffee sensory quality responds mostly negatively to reduced rainfall. And so here we're looking at the results from one cultivar, H1, showing the treatment response by sensory attribute. The bar chart on the left shows the score of each sensory attribute under rainout conditions in pink and control in brown. And the dot and whisker plot on the right shows the main treatment effects for each attribute. And these figures, the dotted vertical line at zero represents where the rainout treatment had no effect on the attribute score. 
And what we're really interested in is the direction of the effect. Whether that little colored dot, which represents the average effect, is further to the left, meaning there is a negative effect of rain out treatment, or further to the right, meaning there is a positive effect. And attached horizontally to each of those colored dots are two lines, one thick and one thin, that represent how confident we can be in the direction of that estimated effect. Where that thin horizontal line doesn't overlap zero, we can have a 95% confidence in the direction. And where the thick line doesn't overlap zero, we can have at least a 75% confidence. And what we see in these results is a consistent negative trend in response to reduced rainfall, though our confidence doesn't quite reach that desired 95% level. And if we look at the results for the other cultivars included in the study, we can see that the trend stays mostly consistent across the cultivars, with a few exceptions, such as here with, uh, uh, sorry, with aftertaste in Via uh, where the average estimate is slightly positive. But for some attributes like acidity, there is a strong consistent pattern of negative shifts in response to reduced rainfall especially with the CAT44 cultivar in the bottom right-hand corner there, where we can be more than 95% confident of that negative response. And what this suggests is that acidity could be particularly sensitive to changes in water availability. Now, the volatile analysis identified 33 volatile compounds in our green coffee samples. These are listed out on the y-axis of this figure, but don't worry too much about not being able to read the text. I'm not gonna go too deep here into any of these specific volatiles. Instead, what I wanna point out here is broader general patterns. What we're looking at is another dot and whisker plot showing the treatment effects for each volatile. And just as we saw with the sensory attributes, many of these volatiles showed a slight negative shift in response to rain out treatment with a few notable exceptions. For example, butyrolactone here may have a positive effect, which is interesting as it has been associated in past studies with certain negative sensory quality attributes. And additionally, there is one volatile for furol, which had a significant negative treatment effect to at least a 95% confidence level. And though for furol has been associated with Certain types of flavors in coffee in past studies, it's been associated with bready flavors and caramelly flavors. It's gonna be really important to understand how different volatiles present in the coffee might combine to create perceptions of attributes like acidity, body, balance, and flavor. And so ultimately the results of this experiment suggest that a change in the amount of rainfall that coffee plants receive can influence their sensory quality. And we also saw that volatile profiles shifted in response to reduced water, which is an exciting step towards understanding the drivers behind sensory quality shifts in coffee systems facing climate stress. And the results of this work also raised other key questions. First, what does this mean for producer livelihoods? And second, does our experience in this tightly controlled experiment really translate to what producers experience in the field? And so that leads us into my next research question. Now that we know that climate change might influence coffee quality, it's important to know what those quality declines mean for smallholder producer livelihoods and agroecosystem resilience. To address that question, I collaborated with some awesome coffee producers at Bella Vista Coffee in Antigua, Guatemala to evaluate how local climatic shifts have influenced coffee quality and economic value over time. For this project, I analyzed seven years of coffee quality data from 17 coffee farms that were managed by the same agronomists, had their coffee process at the same facility and had their quality evaluated by the same panel of coffee tasters, which offered a really unique opportunity to control for key variables that influence quality. 
And it's important to note here that real price data was not collected for privacy reasons. Instead, all economic valuations are based off of aggregated estimates compiled by the Specialty Coffee Transaction Guide, which provides estimates of prices paid for coffees in Central America across quality score brackets. Climate data was extracted from TerraClimate, which is a high spatial resolution data set producing monthly estimates of climate and climatic water balance, um, which also has some pretty robust forecasted climate data sets. And specifically, I was interested in climate variables with a connection to drought, including temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure deficit, or VPD, which is an indicator of atmospheric drought, and the Palmer Drought Severity Index, or PDSI. And finally, I used the farm and climate data to develop a set of hierarchical statistical models by testing the sensitivity of coffee quality to these terra climate drought metrics. And ultimately, I found that there were five annual terra climate variables, all related to temperature, that had a significant association with coffee quality for the farms in our data set. And here we're going to first take a look at lowest temperatures labeled as T min. And what we're going to see in this figure is the quality score on the y axis in relation to the minimum, mean, and maximum lowest temperature as displayed on the x-axis. The data we're about to look at is also going to be sorted by cultivar lineage with different colored lines and uncertainty envelopes indicating different cultivar lineages. And so if we look at this data, we see that for two of these lineages, Bourbon Typica and Intragrest, which make up the bulk of the lots in our data set, quality tends to decline as these minimum temperatures rise which suggests that warmer conditions could lead to losses in economic value associated with losses in quality. This other cultivar group, Ethiopian Landraise cultivar, which is shown here in red, responds quite differently than the other groups, maintaining higher quality <clears throat> across uh, environmental conditions. These cultivars are interesting. They are known for their distinctive and desirable flavor attributes, and the continually higher scores that they received in this study might be in part attributable to the inherent desirability of their flavor profiles. They're known to be delicious and in part attributable to the fact that there were fewer of these lots in our data set because they're more challenging to produce. And the same patterns hold when we look at the highest temperatures experienced on each farm, or the Tmax as it's labeled here. And so the takeaway here is that an increase in temperatures is associated with a decline in quality for most of the lots in our study. And with this finding, it becomes really interesting to look at projections of how these associations might lead to climate shifts um, under forecasted climate scenarios. And so using data from TerraClimate, we looked at two forecasted warming scenarios, a more likely two degrees Celsius and a higher end, more severe four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And what we're looking at here are density plots of each climate variable under these two forecasted 30 year climate scenarios as compared to a baseline scenario of the conditions from 1985 to 2015. For each of these density plots, the y-axis shows the frequency of each climate condition on the x-axis. And so, for example, if we look at the maximum temperature and minimum temperature panels, as we would expect, we see shifts in temperatures of roughly two and four degrees Celsius for each scenario. And while the precipitation patterns there in the bottom right Stay roughly the same. One interesting shift is seen in the projected VPD conditions under that higher end 4C scenario. VPD or vapor pressure deficit is a measure of the difference between the amount of moisture in the air and how much moisture the air can actually hold. And so when VPD is high, it means that the air is dry. It's a really good integrative indicator of the interaction of heat and water stress. 
And what's interesting and worrisome in these projections is that much more time in the severe climate scenario is spent above the estimated stress threshold of coffee of between 0.9 and 1 kilopascal. And so my next step here was to use our models to predict quality scores under forecasted scenarios. In this plot, we're seeing um, another density plot. The x-axis shows what we refer to as the quality anomaly, meaning the amount that the quality differed from the annual mean across all three scenarios. And the y-axis is showing the frequency with which a particular anomaly occurs in the data set. Under both climate scenarios, we see a negative shift in quality scores when compared to baseline. Though on average across this 30 year period, quality scores for the 2C scenario are only approximately a tenth of a point lower than baseline. However, we do see more severe quality impacts under the more severe climate change scenario with a decline in average score from 85.2 down to 84.5. A drop which, while seemingly small, could actually have pretty meaningful economic impacts. When we use that aggregated data from across the specialty coffee industry to estimate price per pound for these coffees, we see that the economic impact of climate change, and particularly the more severe climate change scenario, could be quite significant. Under that 4C scenario, way more coffees would receive the lower end of prices and way fewer coffees would receive the higher end of prices. And overall, this equates to an average loss in value of roughly 30 cents per pound across this time frame. Now, 30 cents might seem like a small amount of money, but it adds up. And so I'm gonna quickly give a super simplified example that demonstrates what this effect would mean in practice. Now imagine a five hectare farm that produces 20,000 pounds of coffee each year. Pretty common farm. That would translate to an average annual revenue of $50,000 each year under baseline conditions and just over $43,000 a year under the more high-end climate scenario. Now, although this is highly simplified, a loss of that size would translate to a roughly 14% decrease in annual revenue from quality losses alone. And for small farmers running on tight margins, this scale of loss could be a really big deal. And it could really reduce their capability to respond to disturbance, which as we've discussed earlier, could play a role in degrading resilience. And so the results of this study helped to confirm some of our findings suggested by our field study in Costa Rica. That is, climate change is likely to negatively impact coffee sensory quality, and importantly, overall economic value. And moreover, this case study also highlights the importance of integrating other elements of harvest value, apart from yields alone, in research that evaluates the impact of climate change on crop systems. It also invites exciting next steps. First, it's important that we assess the implications of climate-driven declines in economic value for working landscapes and the human and ecological communities that are in intertwined with coffee production systems. Now, after graduating from UF last spring, I was fortunate to begin a postdoc fellowship with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute to work on addressing these types of research questions in South American coffee landscapes. And second, given the kinds of research that I work on, I'm really interested and passionate about understanding climate change effects and sharing that knowledge with others, particularly in the communities that might feel those effects most acutely. And so I do believe that it's critical to broaden research impact through education, particularly climate change education in agricultural communities. And so, for example, in 2020, I conducted an outreach project to connect students with climate change education through a unit on agriculture. And from that outreach initiative, I developed and published a framework for enhancing climate change education, 
particularly in rural agricultural communities in the US where climate change remains a polarizing issue and residents may be less likely to prioritize climate action. However, we know that uh, in many agricultural areas, there are projected climate shifts that are likely to impact local agricultural systems if they're not impacting them already. And so this really creates a useful opportunity to bridge the more abstract concepts of climate change with more immediate priorities and interests, which can help improve accessibility and long-term engagement. And so ultimately I proposed and published a three-part framework to bridge local and global systems connect local systems with global climate change and connect with local stakeholders to design actionable solutions to climate threats. And currently I'm finishing up a research project to test the ideas I lay out in this framework. And ultimately I hope to continue throughout my career to develop and improve upon strategies to actively and effectively build interest and engagement with the urgent issue of climate change. Okay. So that brings us to the end of my presentation. Um, to sum up, my research suggests that first, it's necessary to account for factors beyond yields, uh, such as coffee quality and profitability in order to capture a full picture of agroecosystem resilience. Second, coffee, an ecologically and economically significant crop, is threatened by climate impacts to sensory quality, which could ultimately have rippling effects on the ecosystems and communities within coffee landscapes. And finally, it's absolutely critical to engage with rural agricultural communities to enhance climate resilience. Okay, so I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who supported this research, especially my PhD advisors and co-chairs, Dr. Chris Wilson and Dr. Luke Flory. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions that folks might have if we have time. All right, thank you so much, Emily. That was really, really interesting. Um, and as a, uh, I'm not a coffee snob, but I really love coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend who's definitely like on the coffee, he's like further over there, but um, but yeah, we have um, a few minutes for um, questions and I'm gonna see if I can kind of bring people, the Zoom people up here for the people in, yes, kind of, okay. All right, so does anybody have any questions? And if you are, if you haven't been in this room before, there's like a little mic in front of you, you just hold it when, until the green button turns, or the green light turns on, and then just keep holding it while you're asking your question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Emily. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It's very interesting to hear about uh, all of your work and very important. Uh, and I'm really curious uh, to know if in the Costa Rica, the place that you were doing your research, if you are also discussing with the community, what would be the potential strategies to face this uh, potential uh, reduction on the quality of the coffee? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in Costa Rica, I worked with um, the agronomists from the local cooperative, Copidota, um, and they helped to inform the cultivars that were selected for the experiment, um, and also the kind of overall research design at the beginning of that process. Um, and the cultivars that were selected for that study were pretty interesting because they ranged in terms of their baseline quality. Um, and so we were definitely all interested in seeing if planting these newer hybrid cultivars would help to maintain quality uh, over, over time and over conditions where uh, in comparison to the more traditional cultivars that were more uh, common in the area. So that, that uh, the selection of those cultivars was testing one of the strategies for adapting to climate change. Any other questions in person or on Zoom? Could you tell us a little bit more about the ranking? 
like how how does one you know somebody who knows nothing really professional about coffee how does that work like how I don't know take it how you want it however whatever you think is most interesting about how one I'm, I'm sorry I can't hear the question if you could hold your button down that would be really helpful. Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. I was holding the button, but on a speaker that was not working. Hi, I'm Hey. Thanks for the presentation. That was very interesting. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the process of rating and ranking coffees? Yeah, I'd love to. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so uh, the process of evaluating coffees for quality, um, it's, it's a process called cupping. Um, and basically what cupping entails is you take a sample of roasted coffee. Um, there's all kinds of other little details and rules that I won't get too deep into how long that coffee should be roasted for, how dark it should be after roasting, how much time should pass since roasting, all that fun stuff. But the, the kind of meat and potatoes of it is you take a roasted coffee sample, you grind it into a little bowl. And then there is a several step process for evaluation. First, you smell the fragrance of those dried coffee, of those ground coffee um, beans and um, give that a grade in terms of its fragrance or its dry smell. You then pour water on top of it. It's basically like cowboy coffee, like very basic French press, sort of uh, uh, steeping grinds in water. Um, and then you smell the wet smell of those grounds and assign that a score. And then over the next, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, you taste that coffee with a spoon, aerating it into your palate, and you try to pull out and score on a scale of six to 10, these different attributes. So how, how significant is the acidity and what is the acidity like? Uh, what is the body like? Is it more thin or is it heavier bodied, a little bit thicker in your mouth? Um, and so you pull out each of those. And then at the end of that process, once you've evaluated all those different attributes, it gets added up to a score up to 100. And that's the score that's used to assign values to coffee and talk about its, its overall quality. It's a really fun process if you've never done it before. Um, a lot of local coffee roasters and coffee companies will have public cuppings. And so I highly recommend checking some folks out and seeing if you have an opportunity to, to join them for a cupping. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. That sounds super fun. Yeah. And I see there's a raised hand. Uh, Jason, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a big fan bold bean coffee so i'm gonna try to get on their one of their cupping panels because that sounds awesome yeah um i just had a question about the slide you showed about uh comparing some of the results you got for the tmax and tmens for the three cultivars and if you could describe a little bit more about um what you got for p values and r values there if you had an r square value i mean um it, it seemed like there was a, a good bit of noise on that um particularly for the uh the top yeah that's right that one yeah so there there is quite a bit of noise there's a lot of variability these were the ones that emerged as um the the best correlations amongst all of the different climate variables that we looked at um I don't have the exact R values on me right now, but if you'd like, you can, um, I can, I can share some of that data with you um, after the fact, if you'd like, uh, yeah, if you want no to send along an email. So, so these, these were significant. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. These were, these okay. were the significant relationships, but I don't have the exact numbers on That's me at fine. this moment. That's I fine. apologize. <laughs> okay. No worries. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And it was interesting because I I expected to see a, a more connection between quality and the the rainfall variables, so uh, precipitation, um, VPD, uh, but it turned out that temperature was was the most important thing. So, and I, I mean, interesting I just, to see. It's it's interesting. I'm I'm I guess I never thought about this before, but you could 
you're free to wonder whether this is going to have implications for things like the wine industry, winemaking industry, or any other agricultural industry that really depends on a, a very um, fine sense of taste for a lot of the, the users. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, all terroir driven crops, it's definitely a really important thing to think about things like wine and tea and chocolate and cheese making, <laughs> um, thinking about how climate change will impact uh, uh, the quality of those different crops is really important. And beyond quality, there's, you know, our sensory quality, there's all kinds of other factors that influence um, profitability overall that that influence overall value. So things like physical quality as well, right? Um, uh, uh, for, for different crops, there's different, you know, different factors that can make that crop more, more valuable or fit into a different quality uh, bracket apart from solely sensory quality. And so um, one of my big takeaways here is that thinking beyond yields uh, is, is really important as we look towards climate change effects. And even maybe some of the other co-occurring um, impacts of lack of water um, I mean, Maybe increased requirement for for pesticide treatment or or other things that might go along where plants are stressed out. Um, there's a lot of implications. It seems. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well that puts us right at our time. Um, thank you for everybody for the the discussion. Thank you, Emily, for a great presentation. I want to remind everybody that Emily's um, contact information is on the flyer, I believe. Um, so you, if you have any additional questions, um, you can get in touch with her that way. Um, for uh, people online, if you have any questions or concerns about the seminar, feel free to email me or if we need to set up a time to talk, uh, we can do that. For anybody in here, I will hang out for a little bit um, if you want to chat. But otherwise, thank you very, very much. And I will see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.